This is the Neurosurgery Podcast. Welcome back. Well, you're now here on our third deadly sin to talk about gluttony, gluttony. and temperance. Okay. For this, I have no pithy quote. <laughs> I have no reference. I just have the remains of our lunch. Dominoes. And what is to come. So this is a great uh, 2019 California cab. We are drinking in honor in 2019 of the start of the podcast. So, JP, if you will. And we can be drinking for the rest of the recordings now, I think. That's right. The 2019 was uh, a big year. That was the year you were the head of the spine section. Cheers. Cheers. The year I graduated and matched. Delicious. Yes, excellent. And as you said, the year we started this podcast uh, at CNS in San Francisco That's in right. November. Um, That's right. The year I got locked in an elevator on the way up to the uh, <laughs> secret president's suite party that you got me into. Um, I've told that story to some friends, but uh, we're pouring wine because I was, I was just laughing with Dr. Wang before we started this episode that a couple years ago uh, we were doing a New Year's resolutions episode. And we said, oh, what did, you know, this year here, let's, what, what are you going to do this year? What am I going to do this year? What will our resolutions be? And I said, well, we're definitely not going to stop drinking. And we, <laughs> we had a laugh about that because I think anyone who knows either of us knows that we do enjoy alcohol uh, from time to time. From time to time, In yes. various quantities. Yes. And so I think not just for you and I, but uh, obviously many adults, but certainly within neurosurgery, any surgeon, any medicine in general, any doctors, lots of people drink, lots of people drink too much. And I don't think in my life, it's a problem. I don't think in your life, it's a problem, but for many people it is. And it's an easy path away from responsibility and into all sorts of uh, different kinds of trouble. So talk a bit, this is, we're gonna get real therapy here. Yes. Talk a bit about your relationship with alcohol, <laughs> Dr. Wang. Well, you know, it's interesting because uh, you know, there's so many different mind-altering substances available, right? Yeah. The difference with alcohol is there's a couple. One is that it's legal if you're over 21. Mm -hmm. uh, obviously, it's not legal to be inebriated in certain settings, obviously, right. right? But the consumption of alcohol is not illegal over 21, and it's heavily regulated. Yeah. So, in other words, the dosing of it, uh, what is it dose, how much alcohol the percentages are on the label. I was recently at a bar that, and I was like, well, we're gonna throw a big party, it's on campus. And it turns out 26% is the max alcohol concentration for a wine license. So they have 26% Jack Daniels. Ah. And, but it looks just like Jack Daniels. So we're drinking and we're drinking like, what's going on here? And they're like, oh, it's only 26%, not yeah. 40%. So, you know, 52 proof. But, uh, you know, it's so, so you can quantify it. You can have a sense that I'm going to drink this and I'm going to feel a certain way. It also is socially accepted, right? And right. so, and it's, it's actually something that reaches a very high pinnacle as we had Rolando Garcia on for the Spine and Wine episode. Yeah. Um, so it's rarefied its highest levels. In other words, I don't think that there's a market for cocaine of different tranches where it's like, well, this is the high end cocaine and this is the low. Maybe there is, I don't know. I don't yeah. know the cocaine market, but it's certainly not going to be available to investigate that on the internet in that way. Yeah. Right. And I mean, the, the relationship between humans and alcohol predates society. There, yes. there are people who make an argument that, uh, brewing beer or some early equivalent of beer was a strong motivator in the development of agriculture. Right. And so, and, and we know, we know for a fact, anthropologically, historically, alcohol has been with us for a long time. It's been part of our religions, part of our rituals. Uh, and even today, you know, it, it's a social lubricant, we say. It is something that when used, what I would say, properly, there is a proper use for it. It's something that makes us get along better because, you know, we relax and we, we enter. A for most shared, people. For most people. Yeah. We enter a shared mental state, right? right? Um, but that's the species relationship with alcohol um i do want to drill in a little bit more with you and me yeah were you how old were you when you started drinking so i Not never like first drink yeah first drink i had my first drink ever in my life when i was uh pledging a fraternity at stanford mm. so i was already well out of the home 
I was yeah. in my third year of college, essentially, but second year of Stanford, which was my final year. Wow. Yeah. So I very much resisted any. I've never taken any illicit drugs in my entire life. I've never tried marijuana, cocaine, quaaludes, LSD, any of that, ever. Only alcohol. Yeah. So I think, you know, I've been drinking more and more as I get older, probably because I have more and more problems to think about. <laughs> you know, your kids, yeah. your life, your wife, your work, and you know, all yeah. these things. But um, th- another flip side of it is that, you know, we do look at this and, you know, these labels just like we talked about envy, we talked about these things. It, talking about wine, for example, can be like talking about uh, sports, mm-hmm. right? There's a whole social culture surrounding not just wine, but all kinds of spirits. And it's exciting. Yeah. People make a livelihood doing this stuff. And it is interesting. So I find that it's one of the few things that as a married guy you're allowed to do, you know, <laughs> pretty much legally. You yeah. Know? And, that, and that's what I think is interesting, again, thinking about this sin virtue pairing, gluttony and temperance. Um, By the way, people are going to see how much faster I drink than you, I think, too. So it's, I'll keep up. Yeah. Don't worry. <laughs> there's, there's a reason that we've stayed in touch yes. all these years. Yeah. Yes. Um, <laughs> but to, to me, I think this sin is about consumption, but I think it's about wanting to feel good. And it's easy to think, oh, you, you must be talking about lust, right? And no, we're going to get to lust mm-hmm. next, I think. But I, I think that lust is something different that's desirous. And gluttony is about the feeling that you get when you consume the thing. Uh, or temperance, which is resisting that good, the, the, the state of pleasure, the state of feeling good. Yeah, the modern term for gluttony would probably be addiction. Yeah. Right? Right. Something You're like that. By it. Yeah. Yeah. And it doesn't have to be food or alcohol. It could be sex or gambling or. Yeah. Yeah. So why do you think someone like you, who, you know, you and I on the podcast or even off it, we've talked a bit about your family and your upbringing. Mm-hmm. I assume it wasn't a house of drinkers. No. Right? Absolutely so not. How do you think that someone like you, who was not raised in that kind of environment, is exposed to it in college, so you're still kind of in a formative state, but you're older, which, but that also means you didn't have years of growing up around it to kind of know, know the demon, right? Yeah. You, you didn't have a, a history with it, and you didn't see how people tolerate things. Now, you drink a lot. Again, I don't think you have a problem, but like you drink frequently, yes. you have parties and stuff. How do you, but clearly it's not, your, your life's not falling apart. How do you think that without growing up exposed to it, you learned to manage that so it didn't become an addiction, didn't become something that consumed you, and it's something you could use as as a tool or as a controlled pleasure? I don't know that that's necessarily going to be the case going forward forever, right? So I can't predict the future about myself. But I, but like you, I don't have to drink. I can go a month without drinking. I can go a year. I can go days. It doesn't. Yeah. We're not addicted to it, although we enjoy it, right? Right. It's two different things. But it can become something that becomes habitual, too, which yeah. is different from addiction. I think that I'm going to have a – I'll try to do a mea culpa on every one of these episodes. That in my fellowship, our fellowship, we are very heavy drinkers. Yeah. Uh, and we – I'll explain to you why. And I think it – another Got him. Right? There's blood there. One so, every episode. Yes. <laughs> yes. Gooby, take notes. Just kill him. <laughs> so um, the – the, the reason why we like to drink together, there's a couple. First of all, all the reasons aforementioned. But it's like a truth serum. Yeah. So if I want to understand my fellows and residents, I want to see them drink. And if they don't drink for non-religious purposes, in other words, if you can't drink because of religious purposes, that's one thing. We're never going to make somebody drink. It's yeah. not hazing. But if there's no objection to it, and we're never going to push people beyond the limit, this is not hazing. Like, we are trying to get honesty out of people to help them. It's like hypnotism. Mm -hmm. Like hypnotizability can be used to help people. It's not just to control people. It's really to help them. Yes. So understanding that one resident's true fears are, you know, blah, 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 X, Y, Z, helps us as their mentors to help them bridle that and get control of it in a productive way. So that's where we use alcohol extensively. Now, honestly, like we're also, it's a guilty pleasure. We're having fun, yeah. social, all that too. But that's the primary reason. Yeah. So then, have you known 
and it's a leading question, I assume the answer is yes. Have you known surgeons, friends who fell by the wayside and, and alcohol took them out? Absolutely. Many. Yeah. How, if you knew them well enough, we're not going to name names, obviously, but if you knew them well enough, did you have a sense that it was a problem before it reached that tipping point? How, how do you recognize that in someone? Because I also drink a lot, right? Yeah. I don't think I have a problem. I don't think anyone who knows me would worry about me in that regard. But you never do know until you know, right? So have, have you been able to right. find a way to... So genetics of alcoholism aside. So yeah. that's obviously a, the elephant in the room, right. right? There's genetic determinants of everything. Every one of the cases that I can think of where things got like uh, out of control either in a fairly substantial way or in a devastating way. Mm. And nobody that I knew that died, but yeah, mm. sure, DUI, sure, uh, loss of privileges, mm. yeah, hideous uh, out-of-work situations that created um, a lot of trouble for them and that had real impacts. There was an impetus that led to it. So I feel like the mm. gluttony is brought on. Like there's a predilection for gluttony of certain sorts, but then it, there's usually a trigger so a life crisis, and then, boom, you're into this. So that's why I say, like, I can't speak to, like, if I enter a life crisis, like, am I going to become addicted to alcohol? It's possible. Like, I'm not so, so, so prideful as to imagine that it's not possible. Yeah. You know, certainly maybe I would be addicted to heroin if I did it. I don't know. I don't really know. Yeah. But I can tell you, as you get older and older, here's a good thing. For the young people listening... It's very hard for old people to get addicted to even narcotics. Like over 65, they really just don't kind of get addicted. Mm. It, I'm not saying it can never happen. I'm saying it's just not probable. The people dying are all younger, yeah. 20s, 30s. And that is a huge problem, by the way. But if you can hold out, like Jordan Peterson talks about it, the man can hold out till his late 20s, kind of staying even just sort of like through a straight and narrow, they're probably going to be okay. Yeah. So I know I've sidebarred it a bit. No, not at all. Um, but I do want to... <laughs> not in, not, that, not that's enabling how, or encouraging. That's how your glass is going to stay lower. You're pouring. Um, but I do now... I, I think you have to give the devil his due. Yeah. We're in America. We're in Western culture. We drink. We got to talk about alcohol. But mm -hmm. the other drugs are there, right? That's right. And you have... Keep going. Yeah, I'm just in the AC. Yeah, you have a great take, I think. Um, whether or not... I or anyone agrees, a good take is a good take, um, where you talk about the drugs that neurosurgeons use <laughs> yes. and the drugs that neurosurgeons don't, don't use. use. So let's get that on the record. Um, what, you know, it, it's one of your things. So on let's the hear record. it and then dissect it in terms of gluttony and temperance if, if the drug is driving you or if you're driving the drug. Okay, so first of all, we're not endorsing illicit drug use. We're not talking about it in any way other than as a discussion, as a psychological experiment right. of mine. A theoretical experiment. So there was this whole case. It, we talked about it in the podcast before that someone came in the room and we were talking about like, you know, I hope no neurosurgeons do any drugs, illegal drugs. And, you know, cer certainly, you know, nobody in this room. And then someone piped in and said, I do, I do marijuana. And then yeah. I turned around and I dropped, I think I dropped the instrument, which I never do. I was like, what? And then the person said that they use marijuana and nothing against marijuana users out there, by the way. Like I know it's a thing now. But I was like, why would a nurse, why would you want a neurosurgeon to do marijuana? Like, for me, the drug would be Adderall. Right. Duh. Like, <laughs> smarter, faster, better. And then, okay, maybe cocaine, methamphetamine. Yeah. Okay? Not that I would ever do those drugs. But if, if you said, Mike Wang, you're going to take a drug for the rest of your life, you're going to get addicted to Adderall. Yeah. All day long. Right? Makes you better. But not quaaludes. Not, you know, not, di not diazepam or, or barbiturates, yeah. not marijuana for sure, not heroin or opiates, psychostimulants. Stimulants and activators, right? Yeah, and then secondary to that would probably be hallucinogenics after that, although I, I don't think I'd ever want to do that stuff. Right. But people say you get really creative, so there's yeah. probably, like, real benefit to lysergic acid and stuff like that, derivatives. Right, and so what's interesting about that breakdown is that you have stricken from the universe of neurosurgical substances all the things that don't get people into trouble, right? Because suppressants, suppressants, right? Because yeah. you don't get out there. But cocaine, meth, the uppers, they get people into trouble, yes. both on the job, off the right. job, with the law. Um, so why do you think it is that 
these substances that make you go faster, do more, are the ones... Because, again, if you take someone who is a physician, who's a neurosurgeon, who yeah. is putatively a force for good, and you give them a, a go drug, you think, oh, we'll do more good. But then they wind up in a place of trouble, hurting themselves, hurting other people. What I mean, goes wrong? I, you know, I, there's obviously genetic determinants again. Yeah. Um, and these drugs, uh, to be totally in open disclosure, are used frequently in controlled settings by the military, yeah. by athletes, by motivational speakers, right? I mean, you and I don't, because yeah. we're, by nature, more conservative and controlled. And I mean, Adderall in college campuses, even high school, oh. is, come on, right? It's, it's like coffee. It's endemic. Yeah. Yeah, and, and I don't drink coffee either. Right. Right. So just to be clear, I don't drink coffee. Mike Lawton doesn't drink coffee. We heard about that on the podcast. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think, I think the reality is, look, no, we're not superhuman. And the, the most important thing about these seven deadly sins, and we're going to get to mine, are to understand where yours are the strongest. Right. Right? To understand, like, we're all Marvel superheroes. So which one are you? Right? And so with regard, going back to the alcohol, I think... Social acceptability is very important in this world. We're in a highly structured, fairly transparent society. Cameras everywhere. People know. They can find out. They can watch. They can yeah. find you. That's really important. And so, look, the, the honest truth is that Mormons are very successful for a reason. They don't drink. They don't take caffeine. They save yeah. all their money. They have lots of kids. But that's pretty freaking boring. Right? <laughs> right? So gluttony has its positive features. Yeah. Gluttony in some ways, and we're probably getting looser just drinking this, like it has the element of humanity. I mean, is it not human to be emotional, gluttonous, uh, you know, desirous and wanting to enjoy yourself? Yeah. That's human. Otherwise, what, we're robots? Well, then let me take a left turn and talk about perhaps the most ubiquitous drug to neurosurgeons um that caffeine. is no not caffeine not ca well ca oh. caffeine i don't think produces a state of pleasure oh i see you're not putting right? it as a drug class okay no yeah. no no. Yeah, okay. I, I i think it's an adjuvant yeah exactly <laughs> uh, like sugar yeah i think a drug that we pursue for pleasure that unites all of us in this field that is socially acceptable not regulated poorly understood Adrenaline. I think that if you want to talk about mm -hmm. gluttony among the group of people that come into our field, any, and surgery writ large, sure, adrenaline junkies, right? I mean, sure, we've had people on talking about hobbies, climbing mountains, racing cars, jumping out of planes, flying yeah. planes, right? We all have the hobbies, but we also open people's heads and spines for a yeah. living, right? And It's never boring. It's never boring. Never boring. And if you think it's boring, you're going to fuck it up. And... And I think yeah. you could look at different subspecialties within neurosurgery, and much like the win-loss matrix you talked about, there's this the other spectrum. Yeah, there's another matrix I'm I'm going to try to define right now, and it's more judgmental. And I think everyone has this a little bit, but every surgeon there's this ratio between, and it's about how much you like the act of surgery, how much you doing the surgery for the idea of helping another person versus I really enjoy this activity. Thrilling. Right. Yeah. It's right. Like point break. Right. Right. But also, Keanu Reeves. But also, like, if you're a golfer, you can go to the driving range, you can golf all night. Right? If you're a bowler, you can go to the bowling lane and bowl all night. If you enjoy the activity of surgery, both the technical, like, just a thing that you're doing mm -hmm. and the way it makes you feel, you only have access to that when you're operating on somebody. Yeah. There, there is no cadaver lab. There is no virtual reality. There is nothing that feels like real surgery. And it's enabling. You're controlling the whole room. Yeah. So, you know, it's an interesting problem because let's go to... Now, this is for the haters, right? Haters, listen in because this you're going to like this. I've been wondering about this conundrum, which is why is it that a certain proportion of cardiothoracic and neurosurgeons on the point of retirement die or get seriously ill within months. Mm. It's a well-known thing, right? Yeah. Neurosurgeon steps back, retires, and within a year they're dead. Now, I don't really know. I've done a scientific study, but I've wondered about this 
And I think actually that we're accustomed to such high levels of cortisol. And I know people want to say cortisol is bad. No, of course. Yeah. Everybody who knows science knows it's not good and bad. It's well, there for a reason. Well, let me real quick, let yeah. me talk to the please, haters. Please. Because I'll yeah, tell you yeah. what the immediate... I'll pour for you while you talk to haters. Yeah. The, the immediate skeptic to that, I'll, I'll be the token skeptic for you, is that, oh, well, the surgeon can tell he's slowing down. You know, she's not feeling at the top of the uh, top of the game anymore. Right. That's well, why they retired. That's why they retired. Yeah, they yeah. retire because bullshit. they're about to die. It's fucking but bullshit. But we all know. We all know, yeah. we all know the surgeon that's who right. is retiring. To those surgeons, cheers. We salute you. Salute you. And the haters. And the haters. And they're not slowing down. We know these people. Mm -hmm. They're it. They look. The a lot same of times they were forced. They were forced, and then boom, they die. Right. Yeah. Right. So, so go ahead, please. Go with the haters. Yeah. Well, well, that's what I, I wanted to acknowledge. The hater reaction. Oh. Like, oh, they know they're going to die. That's why they retire. No, they're full steam ahead. Oh, I meant the hate. Okay, so different hater group. I was talking about the haters. Like, oh yeah, you guys want to be all hardcore Navy SEAL and all this. Yeah. Like, okay, be more mellow, like pediatrician. So. Um, I think they're used to high. We are used to high cortisol levels. Yeah. Super high cortisol levels, and when you take that away, you just die. Well, then let me ask you this. I it, think that's my theory. No, it's uh, it's Friday. Yep. You're operating. You're doing a a micro disc. Are you really stressed? Like, yes. Are you feeling Always. cortisol? Always. Because here's a in my library of quotes. Here's something you said to me once when I was in medical school. I hate surgery. Yes. You said, quote, I hate surgery. Yes. I hate operating. It's so dangerous. It is. Yeah. I don't hate surgery. Like, I don't hate doing surgery. Yeah. I hate the possibility of devastating problems. Right. Which happen all the time. Right. But we accept it as a calculated risk. Yeah. Right. So the cortisol thing is very interesting because I was talking again to one of my other colleagues and, and I apologize, I'm not going to divulge any names, but this guy I love to tears, like, 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 like my brother, younger brother. And he was telling me how, you know, they had a kid and second kid, and then this time the wife was more prepared, so she said, you're going to take three weeks of paternity, paternity leave. Mm -hmm. We can have a whole conversation about paternity leave. But he took three weeks of paternity leave, and by the end of the first week, he wanted to just, I mean, he was crawling on his skin. Yeah. And he's like, I'm never doing that again. Yeah. So is it addiction to surgery or is it that the cortisol drops much? Last week, my wife made me go up to our farm. I almost never do this shit. We were up there for four days, three days, three days. And by the end, like I could feel myself literally like unraveling. And it wasn't lack of surgery, the lack of scheduling that like, you've got to get up. It's, you know, 5 a.m. Like the whole structure was taken away. And I was like, if I do this for a while, I think I might just actually die. And I didn't feel like I was going to die. I just felt like my whole body changed. My brain changed in yeah. a couple days. So we talked about genetic predispositions. There's people who drink or don't drink. There's people who use Adderall, cocaine, yeah. or don't. But we all do surgery. Right. And hopefully, presumably, some large fraction of us get good at it, have good results. And when we experience that universal cortisol spike and adrenaline rush during surgery, hopefully we learn a way to modulate that and channel that to a good experience, right? Where we like the feeling, we love the hyper focus of operating. It feels good and satisfying. Right. And that is a cue for addiction, right? You have a substance spike in your bloodstream. Right. It feels good and you enjoy it. Something good happens. And yet you still, to this day, you you had you said to me like, oh, I hate surgery. You know, surgery is something that we have to learn how to say no to, unless it's appropriate. It's a measure of last resort, as we often talk about. Talk to the young people, the haters, but talk talk to the young people who are just getting their feet in the water, starting a practice, who have a hammer and see a bunch of nails. Yeah. How do you regulate that? Because if I said I love surgery, this is what it ends up being. So. When I was a first year medical student at Stanford, John Adler spoke to us. We had all, I think I've talked about this before, all the specialists came to speak to us. Yeah. And it was not a big room, by the way. It was a small room. Stanford's a small class. And John Adler said, there's nothing like neurosurgery. You get to hold the living human brain in your hands. And I said to myself, and I love John Adler, I, I, I didn't know him at the time. I'm like, that guy's crazy. <laughs> and I want to be a dermatologist after that. Yeah. And the thing is, he is kind of crazy. He like, is like in a the genius. Best way. In the best way. I didn't understand. I was too stupid then. You have to be very careful. It's like loving war. 
there are Navy SEALs that love war. Right. So is war good or bad? Well, it's contextual. Yeah. But if you just need to start wars to wage war so you can have a pastime, that's bad. So here's where it's separate from an addiction. In an addiction, there's no positive externality as an outcome, right? Because then you could say Mother Teresa was addicted to doing good deeds. Right. And we, don't, we never say it like that. We say she was a great person. Right. So there's the very, very fine line between an addiction and a pastime you're committed to, and a passion. Yeah. And passions are addictions. But if you're doing surgery for a good reason, helping people by the large part, meaning over 75% of the time, and complication rates lower than something reasonable, then you're helping people, and your addiction is fueling something great for society. Yeah. Right? Well, and that's why, so that's why I think the framing for these sins and virtues is that they're the motivators, because two surgeons can do the same surgery and have a good outcome, and the outcome is the outcome. That's what happened externally. But if one of them is addicted to surgery and just did it because it made him feel good, and the other one genuinely cares about his fellow humans, want to make somebody feel better, the result is the same. But who is going to have a better internal life, and in the long term, who's going to continue having good outcomes, right? Um, Nietzsche wrote, in peaceful times, the warlike man sets upon himself, right? right? And so I think it's important that we all acknowledge, what are we gluttons for? Tier one level operators have that, that feeling. Yeah. Exactly like that. But I thought where you were going to go with this was, actually, because it's gluttony, about, uh, is it Morgan Spurlock? Oh, uh, Supersize Me? Supersize yeah. Me, right? Won a couple of Emmys, or maybe yeah. Academy Award. Supersize Me was a movie this guy made about eating McDonald's every meal for 30 days. Yeah. And he died last month. It was recent, yeah. Yeah. And I try to have at least 10 fast, meal food, 10 fast food meals a week, right? A I week? try. Well, I mean, Domino's is not fast food, right? Anyway. Shout out to Domino's, right? And they're not supporting this podcast, but that's not fast food. Right. I mean, McDonald's, Taco Bell, KFC, Popeyes, and the like. I try to have at least 10 meals a week. Why? <laughs> I mean, Don't you? Uh, no. So your former boss, Rich ten, Byrne. 10 per week? Rich Byrne loves Popeyes. He does. He eats it every week. I, I love Chick-fil-A. I love some of the Chick-fil-A is the best. But, but I, I like to cook, too. You know my favorite quiz question for anybody listening out there? Yeah. Don't make money off me. I'll give you 100 bucks if you can tell me who the founder of Chick-fil-A is. Ooh. Think about that. So that's how much I love fast food. So that is gluttonous. I love fast food, but why do I love fast food? Because I make an appeal to the common man. Like all my neurosurgery friends, they're like, let's go to the latest, greatest new restaurant in Miami. It's gonna be $600 a head. You know what? Honestly, Chick-fil-A is just as good. It really yeah. is just as good. And I'm not hating on the good restaurants. I'm just saying Taco Bell's not bad. Right. So. That's probably one of my weaknesses. But alcohol is one, too, because I think, look, this is great that we are able to kibitz together. I wish that we could drink with all of you. One day we're going to do that. We're going to have a Nurse Review Podcast yeah, gathering. That would be good. Um, but this topic of gluttony is so important because most nurse surgeons think they have no feature of this. Right. It's a, it's a matter of pride almost, right? Like, we don't, we're not like that. And that's just it. You have to figure out what your thing is so that you can regulate it instead of it controlling you. Exactly. Yeah. So, next sin? Next, appropriately, Deadly after sin? gluttony, will be lust. Coming soon. <laughs>